Hi all, good morning. <clears throat> this is a Borugo, Edward Borugo, my name, Professor Edward Borugo. Yeah, good morning, Professor. Yes, indeed. Uh, I am from the University of Nairobi, and uh, in the University of Nairobi, I work with the, in the Department of Sociology and Social Work. But the way of my profession, I'm specifically trained in uh, social demography. Uh, part of what is a major concern in our Department of Sociology. Now, I'm chairing today's meeting, and uh, I note uh, <clears throat> that there are quite a number of participants so far. Uh, along with me, along with me, uh, the panelists who will do their presentations later. Uh, of course, that includes uh, Zomo Molatia from the NCPD, National Council for Population and Development. And then uh, Dr. Doreen Othello. Are you Doreen? Can I see you? Doreen. Yes. Hello, Prof. I'm here. How are you? Oh, yes. I've just seen you. Yes. Uh, Doreen uh, is with the African Institute for Development Policy. Uh, that is it. Thank you. I'm around. Yes, Afrodeb. And the other two participants from the same organization, UN Habitat, are Dr. Grace Lubale. Grace, have you arrived? I'm here. I don't know if you can, uh, I'm unable to get uh, the video activated, but I'm on. Uh, that, uh, Grace, uh, that is the voice of a man, isn't it? And I'm a real man. A real man? Yes. And these are instances where it's an instance where, of course, uh, some names go for both men and women. You recall, sometime back, I recall, I used to read a, a novel uh, by, and <laughs> that was the novel, which bear both the name of a woman, uh, although it, uh, it was a man. Joyce, Joyce, no, Joyce. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It was always, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> hope, you are, I hope you are not disappointed. No, that is great. <laughs> but it's great. It's great. It's great to have names that I will share with both. Okay. Yeah, sour. So there is a Grace Lubale. Sure. Okay. okay. Along with the Grace Lubale. Yes, Grace. Is Dr. Thomas Chiramba, also from UN. Habitat. Are you there? Um, Dr. Dr. Chiramba, Chiramba. Is, Dr. Chiramba is uh, not attending. We yes. talked to Beatrice. Yeah. And, uh, since we are from the same office, we made one joint presentation. Oh, OK. You are, you are representing Dr. Chiramba in whatever he was to present. Yeah, we are having a joint presentation. Sure. So I'm sure. representing UN Habitat. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. You. Lubale. Now, I think without further delay, we had better proceed, noting that uh, the area of, our area of concern has to do with the, the global as well as a national concern in the area of settlements, human settlements. Noting that population and the settlement is an area of growing concern at uh, both the levels, at the global level, and at a, a national level. Uh, here, the broad areas of focus are urban and rural settlements. Urban and rural settlements, where challenges are many. Uh, the most disturbing challenge, or at least among the most disturbing challenges, are the socioeconomic effects, then environmental impact, 
along with relational and political ramifications. More in some countries, more in some nations than in other nations. But they have all to do with the growing populations, especially in developing countries like Kenya. And as the population increases, then there are these types of impact. As movements of people continue through migrations to urban areas and within rural settings to outlying areas where there is more space to ease out population pressure in most cases. And then these ramifications begin to appear. Uh, relation of, along relational factors and political implications of that nature. So these are then the issues that we are going to form uh, areas of uh, discussion for us this morning. Now, and this then will enable us come up to a level of consensus, okay, on the type of programs and policy interventions that can be brought to bear on this settlement to enable us to accelerate the rate of well, social growth for sustainable development, okay? And that then must be found. In noting that there are three objectives that should be borne in mind, okay? And uh, the first objective is to share experiences and information on the relationship between population, human settlement, and development in Kenya. The second objective is to discuss population, human settlement, and development concerns in Kenya. And the third objective is to suggest program and policy interventions that are needed to address population, human settlement, and development geared toward the improvement of the quality of life of the people in Kenya. So these are the three objectives that will guide the discussions we are going to witness. Uh, beginning with the presentations that I alluded to earlier, and again, is the time to get to and Zoma Mulatia from uh, NCPD to do the first presentation. Zoma Mulatia. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I hope you are able to see my presentation. Okay. Yes. Yeah, my name is, yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Ch ch thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, my fellow uh, panelist, uh, Grace Lubale, uh, uh, do Dr. Doreen uh, Odero, uh, participants. Uh, 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 it's my pleasure and uh, honor yeah, to present to you uh, uh, our topic, uh, which is in the, the matching. Matic area five. Uh, it, it, uh, we are looking at uh, how population dynamics and human settlement affect the environment. And uh, this is an area yeah, which I think uh, I will try to uh, present uh, and I will also try to, uh, to demonstrate how uh, uh, population dynamics and human settlement has affected our environment. So Chair, can I proceed? Yes, proceed. Thank you. Yeah, this is yeah. uh, the outline of my presentation. I'll look at the overview, effect of population dynamics and human settlement on the environment. 
then I'll look at how these uh, uh, concerns about uh, uh, the effect of population dynamics and the environment are manifested. Then uh, I'll go to recommendation and then conclusion. Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, you know, human population, human settlement, and environment relationship uh, goes back to uh, evolution of human being. And this relationship has been driven by population size and growth and density, structure, distribution, consumption patterns, and mobility, that's migration. And population dynamics or change is influenced by changes in birth, <clears throat> that is fertility, death, mortality, and mobility, migration. And uh, for a population size of any country or a place is determined by uh, birth, uh, minus, is equal to birth minus death plus or minus migration. Uh, and as countries develop economically, they transist or move from high population growth to low population. That is from subsistence of economy to affluence. And uh, that's a transition which is happening uh, all over the world. Uh, some countries have already completed what we call demographic transition, and the others are still in various stages of the demographic transition. And uh, this movement, uh, development, this movement is driven by demographic transition model which it traces through birth, through graphs, population change over time. That is birth rates and in death rates. And uh, if you look at this, uh, the, the picture which uh, I'm showing here, it shows that uh, a, a population uh, has moved, you know, all transit population change, uh, moved from stage one to now stage four to most countries. Uh, stage one is about pre-industrial, you know, that is before the industrial revolution. And uh, the characteristics eh, we, which uh, characterize population as, during this stage was that population growth was very slow because there were the birth rates, uh, there were high birth rates to compensate uh, for high infant mortality and high death rates. And also now when you go to stage two, you'll find that this is transitional stage where population growth grows because birth rates are high and in death rates drop because of improved food production and health. Then stage three, that is the industrial stage where most of us, the countries are. Kenya is in stage three, where population growth lows as both in birth and in death rates drop because of improved food production, health, and education. There are countries which are already in stage four, Germany, Japan, uh, and others, uh, developed countries because population growth levels here, uh, levels are of our levels are up and then declines but and de then declines as birth rate equal and then fall below death rates. In fact, most of the countries like uh, in Germany, uh, countries uh, in the developed world, uh, population growth rate is either 1 point something, 1.2, 1.6, 1.7 there, yeah, which means that uh, it's below the replacement level. Uh, parents are not able to be replaced by their children. In the case of Kenya, yeah, you find that uh, Kenya population size has increased from uh, 10.9 million uh, to 46.7 million from 1969 to 2019. So now with regard to settlement where people live, eh, uh, you find that uh, this uh, where people live uh, uh, set, consists of various types of uh, whether rural or urban, and, and this constitute eh, the, the environment in which people, the environment, that is aggregate condition of surrounding with, which are three elements. First is the physical elements, yeah, which include space, landforms, water, bodies, climate, soil, rocks, and minerals. You also have biological elements, which include plants, animals, uh, what we call uh, flora and fauna. And then uh, we, we have uh, uh, cultural elements, you know, the game parks, the recreation facilities which we have created. Uh, which are largely man-made features. Then uh, man's, uh, the effects of this uh, man on the human population dynamics uh, and the human settlement and environment, uh, as I mentioned earlier, has evolved since uh, the, uh, the revolution, then the, the man evolved uh, on earth. And uh, man's demands and requirements for resources of the environment has primarily tremendously increased over time since pre-industrial period. And this increasing human population has exerted a lot of pressure on the earth natural resources. So the earth natural resources is comprised of uh, non-renewable resources, uh, 
uh, and these are used faster than their pump. And these are oil, gas, uh, coal, name it. And then we have renewable resources that can be used, cannot be used up, or can be replenished themselves over time. And uh, these include wind, solar, timber, land, soil, water, and others. And as a result of this, the interrelationship between uh, uh, population dynamics, human settlement, and uh, the environment. Yeah, you find that uh, uh, human population dynamics and human settlement has had uh, uh, advanced effects on the environment. And some of the advanced effects is that uh, because of the increasing population, increasing population, uh, people have tended to encroach on human, uh, to encroach on in protected areas. You know, they have gone to clear the forest, protect game parks, and uh, put up settlements there. And uh, this uh, and others are to branch out yeah. ecological areas such as use stops and marginal areas. Yeah, and then you find that as a result of this, there is increasing human uh, and more human conflict, which has been caused by this encroachment. And then as a result of rapid population growth, you find that there is a lot of uh, rapid fragmentation of high potential agricultural land into an economical unit units. And uh, also, you find that uh, the increasing urbanization as a result of increasing rural urban migration, uh, there is increasing urban sprawl, uh, uh, which has a result of this increasing urbanization. And this has led to the loss of rich agricultural land in the pre urban areas. And also, there is an increasing generation of industrial, domestic, and agricultural activities. And this has led to pollution of water bodies, air, and land. Then, the, as a result of increasing demand of natural resources, you find that there's a depletion of natural resources such as forest, wildlife, land, and air, which, with the loss of forests, are aggravating erosion, silting of dams, flooding, and the loss of biodiversity. Also, as a result of generation of various waste, gas, air, solid, and there is increasing, uh, we are at risk of climate change. And this is due to increasing generation of greenhouse gases caused by human activities. And this has increased the risk of instances of extreme weather events, drought, flooding, and heat waves. Soil compaction as a result of overuse of machinery, intensive cropping, short crop rotation, intensive grazing, and inappropriate management uh, of soil has led to uh, this soil combustion. And soil combustion uh, has ambered, uh, as caused penetrometric resistance as a result of uh, pressure on agricultural land caused by increasing po population. Uh, there is also the eutrophication, uh, which is a process of pollution that occurs when a lake or stream becomes rich in, overrich in plant nutrients. And this has led to changes in structure and functioning of marine ecosystem. And these changes has reduced biodiversity, reduced income from fisheries and tourism. So uh, how has this uh, relationship uh, between uh, population dynamics, human settlement, uh, and, and the environment, manifest itself. It has manifested itself uh, through air, increasing air and land pollution. And then we have land degradation, uh, as you can see uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, this slide. Then uh, changes in population and human settlement has affected the environment in various ways uh, through the addition of undesirable factor or pollutants that is added to the air. And as a result, you find that like in Nairobi in the morning and even there's a lot of smoke which uh, 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 causes uh, poor visibility. And this smoke uh, is a, it's a result of uh, uh, air pollution caused the direction of sunlight with pollutants produced by also oil emission, you know, traffic uh, emissions. Then uh, you find that uh, we have polluted our water bodies because of increased uh, human activities. And uh, also we find that uh, as a result of an increasing uh, uh, population, there is increased demand for forest resources. And this has led to excessive logging and deforestation in many parts of the country, leading to the dawn of a, a wildlife habitat. And there's also the increasing, uh, this increasing pop uh, population has led to increased uh, uh, and sustainable agricultural practices, you know, slash and burn. And this slash and burn is still being practiced in some parts of the country and has in increased land degradation, both in 
uh, arid and semi-arid lands and also arable land, which occupies 80, 80 and 20 percent respectively of the total land area in Kenya. So uh, also you find that uh, the deposition of solid weights uh, has increased in most of urban areas. And uh, almost all urban areas in Kenya have inadequate garbage collection and disposal, as you can see in this uh, slide. And also the loss of cover, uh, forest cover, has aggravated soil erosion. You know, uh, soil erosion due to increased surface runoff, causing silting of dams, flooding, destruction of infrastructure, infrastructure and building. As you can see in this uh, slide, uh, you see uh, a whole road has been cut off, and uh, this as about transportation, especially in the rural areas. And this is normally, it normally happens because of uh, an increased uh, uh, service runoff uh, when there is uh, every rain. So uh, the other is the increased urbanization due to increasing urban population. And also based agricultural land in very urban areas, you know, urban sport, you know, what's happening in Kiambu, uh, what's happening in Kitengela, and uh, many of our urban areas yeah, you find that the land which is very rich in agriculture has been eaten up by uh, human settlement. So what can we do in order to, uh, uh, to, to intervene? What intervention can be put in place? What, how can we uh, put appropriate intervention to address the challenges which are caused by uh, population dynamics, human settlement, and uh, uh, the environment? Yeah, we need to empower women. You know, women empowerment is one of the interventions which is needed because with the empowerment of women, women will be able to have fewer children uh, if they are educated and if they can control their own fertility and earn an income of their own. And this can be done through an increased uh, uh, provision of uh, uh, microfinance loans uh, to women so that they can, you know, uh, engage in uh, what we call income generating activities. We also need to do family planning, to promote family planning, to help couples choose how many children to have and when to have them. This will enable us to, re to slow down you know, the population growth rate, uh, which has been very rapid in our country. Also, we need to promote birth spacing, healthcare for women and infants. Yeah. And then we also need to promote organic farming, all our input farming system to help conserve our environment so that we don't release uh, chemicals, water bodies, uh, which also find their way into the groundwater and uh, uh, contaminate, uh, cause pollution to both uh, water and land. Also, we need to advocate for integration of population issues into natural resource planning and management. Uh, we need also to advocate for integration of population issues in land use planning and management. And uh, also, uh, though my one of my colleagues will talk about this, is that we need to advocate for population health and environment, PhD integrated approaches in the conservation and protection of the natural resources. So in a, as, as a way of conclusion, uh, I would like to say that uh, sustainable management of our population and natural resources is critical in addressing the population settlement and environment challenges. And this will ensure that our natural resources are used in a way and at a rate that maintains and enhances resilient of ecosystems and the benefit they provide to human beings. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, participants, for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you, Zoma Mulatia, for that uh, presentation. As we move to the presentation by Dr. Doreen Othel. Doreen, Othero. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope my presentation can be shared. Um, I'm just waiting, but while waiting, yeah. uh, I would like to thank uh, Zomo Mulatia for the presentation that has captured every the Mulatia to see what he was presenting and what I would present. I can I presentation Zomo. Zomo is listening. I'm listening. I want to stop sharing. 
think they, no, I think can't see my presentation. I think it's Is open. it loading? No, no, just hold on, hold on one minute. Okay, so while my presenting, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that actually I'm, I'll be speaking about a recommendation is a recommendation to what uh, Nzomo Mulatia has presented, and it will be addressing two of the objectives of our session, and that is suggesting program and policy intervention geared towards improving quality of life and also sharing an experience on population, environment and development. But uh, I'm just wondering, Chairman, what is happening uh, because I don't see my, my presentation yet. Mr. Chairman, can you help me on this? and probably demand that Wait. my presentation is up. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps we, as you try to sort uh, the presentation so that uh, we clearly get it, I suggest that we can move to the third presenter. That is Dr. Grace Lubale. Yeah, but you see. And but Mr. Chairman, Hello. all the presentations. Hello, uh, uh, Professor Burugu. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I've activated for multiple. Yes. She be able to pro okay. She can be able to project now. She can, eh? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Is it slide. me to project or who has the presentation? Nzomo Mulatia and your eight people have the presentation. Okay, Mr. So we were told that. Oh, uh, like, okay, let me. Irene, I didn't understand. What were you saying? But um, I, I've put the screen. Who has the presentation? Please, it, ask Nzomo. I sent it to Nzomo. And he said the presentations will be put together. Mr. Mulatia? Mr. Mulatia, are you on the call, please? Okay, let me try to reach him. Hello, let me present on Abiyave. No. Our project, project on Abiyave. Okay, please project. Let me share, let me share the screen. Is it feasible? I think it's feasible now. Is it visible to everyone? Not no. yet. No, not yet. No, not yet. Not yet, Mr. Blatia. I can see the chair. I don't know what's happening here. Could be there either. Zomo, uh, my understanding was that there is somebody on your end who will be sharing the screens. That's why we sent the presentations over. Let me start again. Eh? Sharing. Mr. Molatia? Yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think you have the, because you're also co host, you can be able to share her presentation. Yes, I, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. 
deposit ya. Ya, confirm whether it is shared because it's showing in my screen there is being shared. You are screen share. You are screen. Can I stop the share? Uh, we can't see your screen. We can't see the screen, Mr. Mulatia. I think. Does Irene have the presentation no, as well? You don't, if you didn't touch anything, you just... Hello? Yeah, can you try again, Mr. Mulatia, now? Mr. Mlesa, can you share? I assist you to project. Eh? It was coming and I don't know what happened. It disappeared. So would you like to give me sharing rights? Uh, yes, Dr. Doreen. Because I don't have rights, yeah, I'm not share, a host. You can share, you can share. I, I have Madam, a we have on. given you sharing rights. Eh? Please go ahead and share. Yeah, please share. Oh, yeah. Dr. Doreen. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Yes. Yeah, it's coming. Can everybody yes, see it? Yes, we can yes, see it. Yes, it is. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes you can see yes, it now. Yes, can. Quite Thank visible. you very yes. much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for that. Okay, I Dorina, mute, that eh? gonna... Please unmute. We can hear her. I have unmuted. We can hear you, Dr. Doreen. I unmuted and even my webcam is on and I'm saying thank you very much for giving me the, the sharing rights. And I pray that the organizers can put all the presentations together and, and share during presentations. So, so Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. In the introduction, uh, I had said I'm Doreen Othero. I work with the African Institute for Policy uh, Development, AFIDEP, as a senior research and health policy analyst. And the presentation I'm going to make is like an intervention to Nzomo Mulatia's presentation. Zomo has talked a lot about effects of population on human uh, and human settlement on the environment. And therefore, my presentation is dubbed Achieving Sustainable Human Settlement in Kenya. And I'm going to talk about an approach called the PHE, the Population Health and Environment Approach. So I'm speaking about a recommendation. The way I've organized my talk, Mr. Chairman, I'll be just <coughs> touching on what, is, what settlement is, settlement challenges that some Kenyans face, and then uh, this population health and environment approach. Can it be a solution to these challenges? Because within this PHE, there is a model that we call the model households. Then can this model be one of the solutions to improving the livelihoods or the lives or the quality of life of people living in different settings. So looking at the picture that I've just uh, put on the screen, uh, I'm sorry about that. You can see that settlement in some parts of Kenya is real, real bad. And the people living in those places are not leading quality life at all. Of course, these are informal settlements, but we also have people living in the rural areas who are not living in correct uh, houses. The houses are not ventilated. And we see that these poses a lot of risks and diseases. So settlement, is basically where people live. Uh, 
It includes the people themselves, the houses, the roads, water, sanitary facilities, and it can also be classified. We have those who live in isolated areas. We have those who live together, like my first slide. And we have those who just live in a place that you can easily define. But the most important thing is that settlement determines people's well-being in many ways. It determines people's socioeconomic interactions. It determines people's health. It determines people's security, people's behavior, and many other things. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, this has not brought out exactly what I wanted, but I just example here of what some people go through, like this support, this is supposed to be a latrine that some people use where they live in their settlements. Some have got makeshift latrines, some lack water, we have garbage that is uncollected, and all these things cause a lot of diseases to the people. But the most important thing is that these challenges that people face in their settlements are actually interlinked. Population, health, environment, development, and livelihood challenges are interlinked and they are interrelated. For example, crowded and poorly ventilated houses will cause ill health, diseases, respiratory diseases. High population growth will lead to this overcrowding. And when we have overcrowding, we see poor environmental conditions, we see pollution, we see ill health, low economic statuses will lead to settling in those informal settlements and also environmental pollution, poor sanitation and unsafe water will cause diseases. So what I'm saying in this slide is that these challenges catalyze each other. We may have challenges in the environment sector that will actually catalyze the problems in the health sector. We have challenges in the population sector that will catalyze the challenges in the environment sector. So it would be wrong to think of interventions or programs in a silos manner. It would be wrong to think of interventions in a vertical manner, and that's what I'm calling the silos approach. So any interventions, any programming that is supposed to really change the lives of the people has to be implemented in an integrated manner so that we touch on environment issues, we touch on the health issues, we touch on population, and Zomo put it clearly in his presentation. We need to talk about family plan in order, in order to manage family, not the slash and burn. We need actually to deal with the degradation of land. We need to deal with the loss of biodiversity and all these should be addressed in an integrated manner so that the people's quality of life can improve holistically. <laughs> and the key word is holistically. Therefore, I'm presenting a, a concept or an approach known as the population health and environment approach. Population health and environment approach, which is one of the actually approaches that are being used globally to address development issues, to address these interlinked and complex challenges that people experience in their settlement areas, whether rural or urban or in informal settlements. We are fronting the PHE approach as one of the interventions that could be used. 
And the key objective of this PHE programming is to simultaneously improve access to health services while also helping communities manage their natural resources, including their settlements, in ways that improve their health and livelihoods and also conserve the critical ecosystems that they depend on. So what I'm saying is, we need to build capacity of the people wherever they are living so that they can access quality health services, family planning, reproductive health, child health, maternal health, prevention of communicable and non-communicable diseases, while at the same time, these people are also conserving their natural resources because these are the resources that they depend on for their livelihoods. And that is what PHE is all about. So what does PHE stand for? When we talk of P, we are talking of services that target the population and I have listed them, including gender dynamics, livelihood improvement, income generating activities. When we talk of H, it is health and it's a spectrum of services, maternal newborn child, malaria prevention, safe water and sanitation, nutrition and others. And then the E stands for the environment, housing and all the other environmental issues. So when we are implementing PHE program, what we are supposed to do or what we do is to train communities to understand the interlinkages between the P, the H, and the E. And once the communities have been trained, they have understood, then they are, they are empowered to implement integrated activities within their communities, be it rural communities, be it informal settlements, they are able to realize that when I go for a family planning method, then I will have the number of children that I desire. And when I have these children, I will be able, or I'll get time to do my income generating activities. My children will be healthy. And I'll also be able to do some environmental conservation, to plant trees, to take care of the rivers, I mean, the, the sources of rivers, and also to use my land properly. So we train communities to do this. And where PHE has been implemented, we have had faster results in terms of sustainable development because PHE cuts across a number of SDGs. Where PHE has been implemented, like in Kenya around Lake Victoria region, even fishing has improved in terms of the kind of fish that the fishermen are catching, because they have been trained on the importance of not catching underage or undersized fish. Where PHE has been uh, implemented, we have seen women empowered economically. They are doing their income generating activities. They are sourcing for their own money and doing their activities. We have seen improvement in health indicators. We have also seen improvement in environmental indicators. And we have done this in Kenya, around the Lake Victoria region, and in Mount Elgon region, where population growth is very high. So what do we really mean? I have said in PHE programming and policy, then the health, the population and environment sectors must work together. Working together means they must embrace cross-sectoral approaches in their policies, in their plan and in their budgets. We want to see the population policy talking about environmental conservation. We want to see the population policy clearly explaining how issues of biodiversity loss will be addressed. 
we want to see that policy talking about how air and water pollution will be addressed. Likewise, the health policy needs to bring out issues of environmental conservation. And the environment policy should also be talking about how family planning will be promoted, how reproductive health issues will be promoted. So this is what we call cross-sectoral integrated policies and plans and budgets. So we want to see policies that are actually integrated. Then working together also means jointly generating and sharing evidence. The health sector, the population sector, the environment sector can generate evidence together so that the synergies that we are seeing between the sectors can come out clearly. And then they should also jointly implement and monitor projects and programs. So that's all about that these sectors that are interlinked and interrelated must work together, not in silos. And PHE benefits, Chairman, as I conclude, this approach has been implemented. We have seen communities and households that are trained and empowered and they have improved housing, good ventilation, household hygiene, no flies. They are treating their drinking water using locally available means. They are using energy cells. There is reduced to smoke in the house participation in environment pollution I and mean population and health. There is an increase in acceptance, ownership, and sustainability of projects by communities because they are seeing the benefits, resources are being shared. But most importantly, Mr. Chairman, there is an increase in men's participation in reproductive health and women's participation in conservation. That is what we have seen in community where this approach has been implemented. And of course, increased success of women and youth to credit facilities. But I want to emphasize number seven. It promotes adoption of what we call the PHE model households. And therefore the intervention that I want to talk about in my last slide that can help improve the lives of people and that is our second no our third objective for this theme and also it addresses the first objective what is this intervention that can help improve the lives of people and this is what we call the phe model households and all the people um, who have joined this thematic uh, group, can you Google, there is information all over. In PHE programming, for a household to qualify to be a model household, it must fulfill the following. Remember I said, we train members of the households, men and women, and we empower them with all the knowledge, with the skills, and occasionally with the resources. So for a household to be a PHE model household, it must fulfill the following. Number one, all the children under five years must be immunized. Number two, the household must have, uh, must treat their drinking water using whichever means acceptable. They must have a dish rack where they wash their dishes and put in the sun to dry. Sunlight kills bacteria. They must have a rubbish pit far bit from the house where they put their rubbish. And any pregnant mother in that household must attend the recommended number of antenatal clinic uh, services. And a pregnant mother in that household must deliver in a 
household must have a clean latrine. The household must the house must be well ventilated, and they should use energy saving cook stoves. And then they must have a leaky bee with water and outside their latrine. Even if the latrine is made, there has to be something that they can use to wash hands. And then the under fives must sleep under treated mosquito nets. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, anywhere where PHE programming has been implemented in Kenya, we have model households. And it is very interesting if you visit, now we have model villages. You go to a home and you'll find all these. All these is what sustainable development is all about. Because here we are improving health, here we are improving environmental, sanitation and conservation. Here we are improving livelihoods. And as I finish, Mr. Chairman, this is my recommendation, that for us to address the challenges of human settlement, for us to address the challenges of poor quality of life, and for us to improve the quality of life of our people, whether they are in uh, informal settlements, in rural areas, we need to promote adoption of the model, the Pichi model households. Uh, for more information on this, uh, you can reach me or you can Google. Uh, I just want to show you some of the best things. As you can see in these pictures, up on my left is a dish rack. There is a lady there, smiled, which has a pot where they put their water and they put what we call water guard, chlorine. And they have even labeled that this cup is not for drinking. It is only for fetching. And down here is what I talked about, the leaky tin. The latrine looks like it is collapsing but there is a liquidine with a piece of soap for washing hands and with clear instructions. You can see a house that is really made of mud and very ordinary iron water, rain water harvesting. These are just examples of uh, the benefits of this PHE programming and what a model household should have. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay. Back to you, <clears throat> Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Otero, for that uh, a presentation with emphasis on population and health for sustainable development. And now let's get to the last presentation, the third presentation by. Dr. Grace Lubale. Um, thank you very much. I've had uh, uh, intermittent power here, so I'll be appearing under Samuel Lubanga, but that is Grace. <laughs> um, let me see if we can be success more successful with um, my presentation. Okay. Are you able to see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning again. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, and Dr. Doreen Othero, um, even uh, Nzomo. I think uh, the, the presentations, of course, build on one another, which confirms the fact that there has been uh, uh, good thinking through what we are doing. And our presentation really is um, uh, reflecting on, on practice, what is coming out of trends uh, and the responses. 
and uh, we share some insights and conclude with um, uh, with what UN Habitat is doing. So just to move on quickly, uh, my presentation is in four main parts. We begin with the trends, uh, move on to the responses and what insights come out of that. And as I've said, conclude with what UN Habitat is doing. Um, I'll just pause and ask whether you can hear me clearly and also uh, whether the presentation is uh, visible on your screens. Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on to the trends, um, I do not want to cover a lot of uh, ground in terms of uh, showing what has gone on because Dr. Anzomo and uh, Mr. Anzomo uh, talked about those trends. Yesterday's keynote presentations also showed us the trends. But one of the things that I just want to point out is that it is a fact that um, over the last 50 years and going ahead, uh, as you will see from the green shading, that uh, Africa and Kenya as well, we are increasingly urbanizing. Uh, a lot of colleagues have covered other dynamics, but that kind of looking at. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about in terms of um, in terms of uh, our urbanization, um, you will notice on that presentation that some uh, things on the exact graphic with a lot of information. But the thing is that we have got our urban situation is characterized by various uh, features. One is informality, the other uh, is just vulnerable. And uh, in a lot of uh, conditions of what may be considered uh, informality. Uh, and in some countries, uh, in Kenya's case, in small, some counties, we are having an explosion of slums in our urban areas. Uh, in Kenya, we note that um, uh, almost 50% of our urban population would be considered poor. I do not want to dwell on uh, the dynamics of how we identify and um, show who is poor, but um, generally speaking, uh, whether it is via econometric models or other participatory methods, uh, about a half of our population in urban areas is considered poor. Um, about less than a third have got access to safe, clean water. Um, uh, Dr. Doreen has just pointed out as well, uh, just about a third have got um, improved sanitation. And yet interestingly, um, we note there may be issues about the statistics, but we know that about two thirds of Kenya's gross income is generated in urban areas. Uh, but our concern to Kenya should be the fact that almost as a Nairobi metropolitan region. Um, it is interesting that we would talk about towns and find out whether our town is urban uh, or not. Uh, but what we do have actually is that um, it's only Nairobi and Mombasa that would be considered 100% uh, urban. Then you have varying degrees and uh, uh, you notice some, some places that one would not expect to be that urbanized, uh, like Garissa, Kakamega, uh, Thika is another one who has joined the, the big three in terms of 100% urbanization. Um, and this begins when you look at the distribution of the population. 
you will notice that we will have what in planning or urban geography would characterize as um, uh, primacy, where the big, the big city in the case of Nairobi dominates the other urban settlements, but also in the counties, we do have uh, the county headquarters taking on the same characteristic that uh, Nairobi is doing uh, nationally. So looking, coming out of that very brief overview on uh, the trends, I, I just want to share what we have by way of responses. Uh, and the general, uh, I'm beginning from the global moving on to what we have in Kenya. And uh, first things first is that um, in terms of urban services, whether it is serious backlog uh, and whatever figures you look at, uh, the possibility of meeting the SDGs remains uh, remote, um, how we do our planning, that does not seem to be in tandem with issues that arise with real changes in our climate that are affecting uh, the environment. And um, for, for us who may be familiar with uh, the nature of urbanization, whether you are driving from say Ngong, in Kajiado County, all the way to Kiserian, uh, you will see that there is development on both sides of the road, whether it is from Nairobi to Machakos, whether it is from along the superhighway, uh, the urban sprawl is a major feature of what we have. And yet even with good changes, we do have uh, rigidity. We are not responding as quickly as we would have. Um, but what has been Kenya's experience? I think uh, we, must, uh, we must acknowledge what the government has been doing. Um, and there have been investments uh, in responsive policy frameworks. Uh, you can look at the national urban policy. Kenya was one of the first countries in Africa to come up with an urban policy. Nairobi, we have the new plan. Uh, of course, devolution, which takes us back to about 10 years ago when we had the counties come in. And I think the mere move to devolution really um, opened up the space and in, inadvertently uh, addressed the issue of um, the centrality and of uh, Nairobi and began to promote a lot of um, uh, equality. Uh, we have ongoing land reforms like the digitization. Um, th that is one side on the policy and you will hear a lot of time, uh, both from governments and other uh, professionals noting that Kenya has got wonderful policies. Um, but I think that is where uh, the good work is to be noted. Wonderful policies on to realizing those policies uh, begins to be a major, uh, a major challenge. We've also had uh, investments in critical urban infrastructure, the standard gauge rail, what is being done in Marindi, uh, and Lamu is one of that. We have investments in water, electricity, um, and housing. Then of course, some of these are being strategic partners, partnerships. We have the Kenya, informal settlement improvement program. Uh, we have uh, the sustainable urban economic development program supported by DFID and KISIP is uh, the, the World Bank. These have all been doing uh, something about our urbanization. However, the main point that we would want to say from Kenya's experience is that even with the right moves on policy and uh, programmatic investments, these efforts are still fall far short of the demands that we have um, in our urbanization. That map uh, is just to give us an indication of our, our urban sprawl where we begin to have a lot of things happening uh, in different places. And one of our challenges in, in uh, reining in or harnessing urbanization is to try and move from uh, a sprawl form 
to a more compact form of urbanization and, and, and human settlements. So this is just to give us uh, what you would find in a typical residence. Uh, and it is a, a common way in, we, in which we develop. Uh, most uh, middle and upper class, middle and upper class uh, residents in urban areas would have a large plot of land and they would want to provide their own infrastructure, uh, including water and septic tanks. But even as they do that, uh, very little consideration is done, uh, taken into account for the environment. I am sharing a phenomenon which um, we are increasingly characterizing as invisible cities. There will be uh, debates about the population of Dadaab, but Dadaab would easily be Kenya's third city, but it is invisible. Uh, that gives you a picture, depending on who you talk to. The journalists give a figure of just under half a million people. Um, and within the UN fraternity, we have a different dating from 250,000 to 300,000 people. But whatever the number, you'll find that uh, the population in Dadaab uh, is certainly higher than what you find in Kisumu city or even Nakuru. Uh, but yet, we do not um, have Dadaab in one of our, our towns. But uh, that shows you a bit of the challenge that we have, but also with the DAB, uh, the questions around environment and conflict as factors that um, are driving our urbanization can be seen. So there's displacement that is because of armed conflict, but there's displacement that we are having increasingly because of changes in our environment uh, uh, that go on. I want to just share something very practical uh, from a county in Kiambu. And we are saying that looking at the trends from the last data, uh, Kiambu County would have an increase, is expected to have an increase of about half a million people in the next five years, uh, which, you know, um, rudimentally done, we are saying that each year you are having about 100,000 people uh, coming into the county or as an increase in the population. Uh, so when you have an estimated 50% of Kiambu as urban areas, it means that 10,000 new urban dwellings will, would be expected. Uh, Dr. Lubanga, Dr. Lubanga, can I alert you please, please Dr. Lubanga, can I alert yes. you that you are almost running out of time and uh, in the next five minutes or three minutes uh, perhaps, you could uh, think of rounding up that is the presentation okay okay thank you prof uh yes. it is rubale and uh, oh, i was just oh, we, had hoped, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we, we had hoped that since it was a joint pro uh, presentation you would uh, indulge us and increase our time but uh let me let me wrap up anyhow uh, please yeah so yeah. i'll go to uh, to the insights, uh, the, the presentation is there, is that globally and literature shows us that um, with good urbanization, we will be able to grow our economies. But what does that mean uh, in, the case of, uh, in the case of Kenya? Uh, in what is coming out for Kenya, related to development. This comes through, we are seeing very good uh, action taking place in terms of investments in urban infrastructure. But looking at the Asian tiger experience, the investments in uh, infrastructure should correspond to the aspiration that we would want to have. And um, national policies and the form of urban uh, urbanization we take would be extremely important in realizing the urban urbanization and the, the benefits that we seek to get. So with that, I just want to conclude our, our presentation uh, and uh, hope that some of the info slides can be shared during the discussion. Thank you very much.
Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Lubale, for that enlightening presentation. Uh, a point of note, again, is that uh, these three presentations have tended yeah? uh, with the exception of uh, Mulatia, Zoma Mulatia, with except they have tended more to focus more on what is happening in the urban environment, the urban settlement. Uh, let's note that 65% of Kenyans in, in rural areas. However, in time perspective, we expect more and more people to move into urban areas. Uh, you may as well know that Korea, for the first time in history, China itself passed the line of 50% urban only 10 years ago. It has been a, a rural population, and it's only in the last 15 or so years that it has crossed the road to urban majority, 50% and over now. Now, in time, we'll be getting into more and more people from rural areas joining the urban population. But for the time being, most of our population resides in rural areas. That is not to say that we can ignore the urban environment. Increasingly, it is also becoming an important area of settlement. So with that in mind, let's see what issues can be discussed in form of questions and uh, answers to, to give, particularly by the panelists who have already presented. Yes. So can we get into the plenary now and see what kind of issues can arise? Any question? No? Let's see who the participants are in this uh, session. In the screen, let's see who is who. Is it possible to enable that? Mulatia? Yeah, 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 I can see, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I can see there are quite a number oh, of people oh. who are already uh, uh, with us. It's only that they have missed their mic. Eh? Yes. But I think uh, they are hearing. Yeah, they need to. Okay, they are hearing. Uh, okay, very good. Then, uh, let's see. Are there no issues to raise for those participants? Yeah, okay. Good job. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, can I say something? Say something, uh, Zomo. Okay. Like thank you. Yeah, I would like to post my to, to, to yeah to direct my uh, question to uh, uh, Lubale. Yeah, yes. regarding uh, urbanization, especially in yeah. Kenya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have heard about uh, urban agriculture yeah. as one of the key uh, uh, contributor to food security, especially in urban areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to what extent is the UN habitat yeah, promoting eh, urban agriculture uh, mm -hmm. pay of uh, 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 increasing food security, especially for the urban population, given that uh, there's a lot of uh, issues of pollution uh, which are uh, happening in our urban, uh, in our urban areas, including uh, cities. Thank you. Perhaps Dr. Otero can uh, help us answer that question. Doreen Otero. Uh, Chairman, the question was directed to Dr. Lubale. Lubale? Yes, the one the, the, the who presented from UN Habitat. Dr. Lubale. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I just want to preface my response with uh, uh, two observations. Number one, um, we understand within the new framework that agriculture is now the responsibility, it's a devolved responsibility. Uh, and we are also aware that um, urbanization and the management of urban is largely also uh, a devolved responsibility. Uh, so that is one, one side of uh, the context that I, I want to raise before I get into what we are doing. So you inhabitant uh, work within GenWorks uh, of agreement with governments. But having said that, uh, what are we promoting by way of urban agriculture? Uh, in our planning um, support that we do with um, uh, we, in, in Kenya, if we look at Makweni, uh, one of the things that we talk about is the need um, to ring face land for, for agriculture, but in our work with the youth, I think that is where we are support. We are promoting the youth to begin uh, to participate in the production uh, of food that would be consumed in urban areas. So you would find that, yes, the framework, first of all, has to be the county spatial land uh, mm -hmm. where that would come. And then secondly, would have um, efforts at capacity building, training youth in new methods and technologies, uh, and then have counties begin uh, to support uh, the youth by provision of uh, capital to be able to do that. Um, how far have we gone? I think we are, uh, the main success has been the recognition by the counties to take up that uh, particular response. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lubale. Uh, any other question? Chairman, uh, this is Doreen. I also have a question for Dr. Lubale. Yes. And thank you, Dr. Lubale, for your presentation. Uh, there is this concept of artificial wetlands in urban areas. And it is a concept that... Back to the the break away sessions. For the next 20 minutes, please reorganize and speak your session. We'll move in. Or you have closed it. Hello. Professor, I was asking a question. Is the station closed? Session one. Session one, all the concurrent session two are running between. 8.30 to 10 are over. We are now transiting to the next set of concurrent sessions, which will start at 10.10. 10. Please, if you are not finished, move to the next session. Conclusion, move to the next Victor, session. Victor, we can't see the breakout sessions at the bottom of the screen like last time. Yeah. They're not yet appearing. We, we so that we can select. In the until, next, until break. when the break is over, you will now see the session. The next eight minutes, all we'll right. see Thank you very yes. much, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think we can stop it there.
Tani kwe nani. Nani. Mambo. Sauti na kuja. Sauti bado.
Good morning again. The course for Professor Tris don't close sessions. Concentrate on your session only. Not to close the live broadcast. Don't close the live broadcast. The podcast. Please share your rooms now. We have set a breakaway rooms and proceed with your respective session. Irene, good morning, delegates. Uh, give us a few minutes. Uh, the chair is the chair for the session is joining us in a few minutes. Kindly give us one or two minutes. Otherwise, delegates, you are most welcome. This is going to be a very interesting session. So I, I we are going to share the objectives once our chair. Uh, join scene. Just give him two minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Irene. Uh, could I kindly ask, uh, we have several people uh, who've joined under Samuel Lubanga, if you can kindly rename yourselves. 
Thank you. Good morning, colleagues, um, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our session on data innovation research. Uh, can anyone hear me? My name is Angeline Siparo. Can we have one person at least? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Yes, we can hear you. Our chair, um, Waweru, is, uh, Waweru Kamal, is uh, joining. He's having a few slight challenges. And as part of the team that is leading this effort, we just wanted to uh, quickly do an introduction and just make sure that you know that you're in the right session. Uh, this session is titled Data Innovation and Research. So if there is anyone who's got, um, who's in, who's, who, who needs to be here, please alert them because the session time changed. And so if we have a few hitches, it's because of the session time that has changed. Our original session had been between 11.40 and 1.10. But in the spirit of comradeship and making sure that we support fully, we shall continue as planned. So with this session, uh, the session objectives are to share ideas and data gaps that exist in Kenya, to share the challenges and opportunities to access data and optimize its, its completeness. And the third thing is to share recommendations on availability and utilization of population and development, data and research in the next decade. We all know the importance of data. And we are also aware that even as we, as, uh, as we deal with uh, the current challenges in Kenya, we know that there exist data and research findings on population and development. Some of it may be very adequate to get program implementation, while others may be efficient. Access and availability of this information is often linked and is considered an expensive undertaking, leading to decisions being made without evidence to support interventions in place. Some research data is also deficient, especially in regards to vulnerable populations like persons living with disability, displaced and homeless individuals, 
And also when we look at um, uh, issues to do with civil registration and critical data, births, deaths and marriages is often lacking or incomplete. In light of the extent which this is available, it is not utilized or shared for decision making. We all know for sure that even in terms of if you look at our population needs, having the correct um, data in terms of births and deaths and marriages is important for us to be able to plan for children in school, for appropriations in terms of budget and everything else that we need. So what is the importance of this session in the conference? This session will give data producers, analysts and users a chance to share ideas on the missing link, share, share existing opportunities and challenges, and recommend measures that can be put in place to address the data information gaps related to generation, analysis and utilization of population and development data. And it was very gratifying to see the earlier session when we looked at the age structure and the discussions that followed therein, how um, we are all forming a critical mass on the understanding of the importance of data, but on, not only data, but the importance of data to form, uh, to guide decisions. And yesterday, um, when Elia Zulu gave the keynote speech, one of the remarks he made was the fact that some of our data is also very old. And so uh, even our current KDHS data is 2014. And even as we prepare this population policy and finalize it, we'll not only be looking at how we make sure that our data is generated on a more routine basis, so that in addition to the landmark data points that we have in terms of census, KDHS, SPA, all those other data points that we usually need, how do we make sure that there's a culture of uh, creating routine, whether it's baseline assessments, to be able to inform? And so that was something that was uh, acknowledged yesterday, and it's an important part. So within this session, as um, the chair comes in to lead, our session. We have um, the chair of the session is the um, social and governance, uh, the head of the social and governance directorate in the state department of planning, Mr. Kamau Waweru, and I'll hand over to him as soon as he comes. And then we have four panelists. The first panelist is Mr. Paul Ngugi, who is the manager for population statistics at the Kenya Bureau of Statistics. The second panelist is um, uh, Ben Obonio, who's going to be standing in and giving a presentation on issues around civil registration and the data leading to births, deaths, and the gaps that we have there. The third panelist is um, Dennis Mwambi, who will be presenting uh, for PRB, Population Reference Bureau. And then the fourth panelist will be Mr. Frederick Oteno, uh, who's the Population and Data Policy Advisor at UNFPA. And I now want to uh, confirm whether my chair has been able to join. Irene, has our chair joined yet before we proceed? Okay, so Irene will give me that feedback in a few minutes, but I just want to set uh, a few things in place. We shall have 10 minute presentations, four of them. So that will be um, 40 minutes. And we will then um, have an opportunity for panel discussion and responses from the presenters. And then finally, we shall conclude and close. If you want to be able to ask a question, kindly post it on the chat so that we can then be able to uh, collect questions that are similar. And then at the end of the process, we'll also give an opportunity. I saw how well it worked in the previous session where you then have your hands up and we can then select a few people to be able to ask questions based on our time. It's now 10.30 and um, we have been given 90 minutes. So we'll try as much as possible to be able to keep to that time. Irene, has our chair joined? Mm. Uh, not yet, eh? uh, probably. Eh? Mm -hmm. um, I could uh, do a, a round of introduction. You've done that. Huh? I've already done that. I want to confirm that um, Paul Ngugi, um, I, I saw, I, I saw uh, Ben Obonio, I also saw um, Dennis Mwambi. Um, can I confirm that my friend Fred Potieno is also on, on as we speak? Yes, Chair, Madam Chair, I'm, um, I'm on. I'm um, registered under Frederick Okwayo. Okay, wonderful. So, yes, I think there is um, Irene. Uh, if Mr. Ngugi is here, I would recommend that in order not to uh, lose time, we would go ahead and start. But I see there's a question from someone from NCPD. 
that is supposed to be in a session for innovation data access protection. So I would recommend Samuel that if you could uh, get in touch with someone at NCPD, just to be able to guide you on where you're supposed to go because ours is looking at data innovation and research. This is the, this is the, um, the breakout room for data innovation and research. So please get someone NCPD to be able to assist. Mr. Ngugi from KNBS, do we have you in the room? Okay, so I would recommend that uh, we proceed my, so that, go ahead. Mr. Ngugi? I hope that um, I hope that uh, you you will be able to find a way to speak because I had you beginning to speak. I hope it's not challenges with um, uh, with network connectivity. If there is if you are one of the presenters and your network is shaky, I would request that you put yourself on um, on a hotspot on your phone so that we don't drop you as you are speaking. So in the absence. Okay, so then we go ahead and start with um, Obonyo, Ben. I know you're on. So can I request that we go ahead and start with you? Looking at civil registration opportunities and challenges, can we go ahead and uh, have you presenting? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. Uh, may I request a facilitation from NCPD to load the presentation. Thank you, I'll quickly summarize uh, the situation on our civil registration vital training system, uh, particularly focusing on challenges and opportunities. Next. Next. Could we make slides, please? Irene. Oh, good. What's up? Let me just um. Then let's let's give it a few minutes and um, uh, Irene. Are you able to share your own your own uh, um, slides, Ben? No, I don't have the permission. Um, Irene, Irene Mohonsu. For the participants, I'm requesting your indulgence as we organize ourselves. It's our conference after all, so we are going to make it work. Okay, thank you, Howard. You have mentioned that Irene has dropped off. So- Let me try if you allow. <laughs> Uh -huh. If Mr. Jarambi can Go have ahead. the presentation, he can be able, he has he has the rights, he can be able to share if he has his presentation. Yes, I do, Lois. Yeah, you can share. I've uh, enabled multiple, whatever, so you can share as we okay. wait for Irene to rejoin. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. You're a, you're a lifesaver. So, Ben, please go ahead and um, share. And um, I also want to request that... Um, even as you're, as, as you're loading, could you tell us a little bit about yourself so that you're not speaking from a vacuum so that we know who Ben Jarabi is? <laughs> okay. Um, I load fast. Okay. <laughs> Are we able to see? Yes. Uh, okay, yes. so go to, go, to the, go to the beginning. Sorry about that. I was assisting our chair. Go, go to the beginning. Okay, now, all right. Thank you, Erin. Okay. Yeah, 
So Ben, please please begin by introducing yourself because that's what the chair should have done for you. And I want to yes. make sure that you're, you're not, you're not, you're not speaking from a vacuum. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, ben Jarab is my name. I'm currently a lecturer at the Population Studies and Research Institute, University of Nairobi. Before then, I had worked with the Department of Civil Registration for 10 years. In between, I spent another 10 years as uh, an independent consultant. Uh, between 2012 and 2019, I was the chair of the technical working group for CRVS, guiding the department in terms of, of how best to improve on vital registration. So it's from that background that I step in to um, present on this. Next. Wonderful, Thank Ben. You. Okay, go ahead. Mm. Now, the civil registration vital system in Kenya operates under CAP 149 of the rules of Kenya which has been in operation since 1928. Within the system, there are two components. The demand side, which entails the population that is supposed to register the occurrence of their right of events and subsequently obtain certificates. But on the supply side, so there should be a system in place that enables the public to promptly register and obtain certificates. We definitely see deficiencies in both components, both from the demand and the supply side. And that deficiency is very clear in terms of completeness of registration that is still um, uh, prevalent. And more so with very wide regional variations. Next. Looking Looking at the registration of births over the past, the last five years, we see from 2015 to 2019, 66% through 76, so it's still not complete. It, uh, but, but then on the right hand side, you can see the performance in terms of death registration is dismal. All through, it is less than 50%. One would expect that with the law that no death should be no dead body should be disposed without registration that it would give and, and births. And as the coverage shows, it has even been declining. So there are serious problems. So that's about the incompleteness. Uh, the next slide will show the disparities. Next. I've just picked the five counties with the lowest registration coverage, both in births and deaths. You can see that while the national average for 2019 was 6%, these five counties are well below the, that national average in terms of births. And look at the position for deaths as low as 4% in Mandera. Next. I teased these five as the key challenges facing our CRVS system. Low priority according to the system, structural arrangements, um, limited motivation to register, poor quality of data on cause of death, and lack of demand for vital statistics from the system. I will comment on each separately. Next. Move, move. The three A. <laughs> Irene, <laughs> sorry, Irene sorry. don't disorganize my presenters. Move for the point. <laughs> yes. Back, back, back. Yes, yes, there. Thank you. We have three sister departments. Oh, God. Irene, please go back. Move to the next, please. To the next slide. Yeah, there. No, next, next, I next, think. next. This is next. There. No, oh, no jumped again. Hey, what's happening? Is that okay? 
Move no, back one, said, one please move, move to the chat. Move the chat. The next before. Hey. Before that, yes, yes. stick there. <laughs> hey. There you are, Ben. Go ahead, okay. please. Okay, okay. We have three sister departments, uh, civil registration, uh, Department of Immigration, and the national registration, which are the one that issues IDs. The sister departments in the sense that they all undertake some form of registration of people. That's more reason why they even belong to a ministry. But when you look at the financial allocations to these three, and I'm using this now to justify my um, assertion that there's low priority according to civil registration. Um, I've just, these are the printed estimates in terms of the amounts of monies allocated to civil registration in the second column, amount um, allocated to immigration in the third column, and amount registered uh, allocated to National Registration Bureau in the last column. Across board, please wait until I tell you to move. Right. Across board, you can see the disparities between the amounts located to civil registration vis-a-vis -vis those amounts to the other two. And on average, Immigration and the National Registration Bureau departments are allocated at least three times what is allocated to civil registration. Yet when you look at the constituencies to which these three departments serve, civil registration serves the whole population. Immigration is simply in and out and prosperity. ID is purely those at ET. That to me is a clear indication that government allocates low priority to civil registration. Next. Structural arrangements of civil registration. Um, there are two types of systems, passive and active. An active system is where uh, people from within the system move out to identify and pick information that is relevant. The passive is where there's a system in place, but it waits for those who are supposed to bring information to it. And in our case, the survey system is passive because when a birth or a death occurs, it is those who encounter that occurrence that have the responsibility of going to report, to notify the occurrence. Now, that in itself has problems because you have to depend on the goodwill of the populace. Motivation to register, which is a follow-up to the passive system. So the population must, one, be aware that they are supposed to notify the current of events and two, to have the motivation to go and report. Now, that becomes an hitch because one, they may not be aware and two, they may be aware, but awareness alone is not good enough that they need to be motivated. What do I gain out of this? So if the general populace do not see the direct benefits that accrue from having to go and register, then that becomes a snag that affects the level of registration. And indeed, when you look at the current right to registration system, there are very few incentives attached to having to go and register. And it's like, okay, I'll go, time goes, and, but why, why, why do I have to take time to spend money to go to the registrar, to the SMT, and, and the, yeah. so limited incentives do not contribute to motivation for the general populace to go and 
notify the occurrence of births and deaths. Next. Now, uh, apart from the issue of completeness, which is a, a quantity element, there's also the problem of uh, the quality of data, and particularly on cause of death. Uh, from the information from the latest census 2019, we note that um, 60% of the deaths were reported to have occurred in health facilities uh, versus 40% at home. We have issues on both, even for deaths that occur in health facilities, that there, there are inadequate capacities of the health staff to report on cause of death. One, that, okay, reporting on cause of death has two components. One is certification. The certification is to help tease out the underlying cause of death so that we can now publish to know the causes of death. Uh, because it's only from the causes that action can be taken to uh, alleviate the, the issues that arise from such causes. So the medical certify the cause of death and then um, coding staff are supposed to tease out the cause of death that eventually goes to the tabulations in terms of causes of death. Now we have a problem such that uh, in our medical training institutions, uh, certification of cause of death is not part of the curriculum. So when clinicians leave uh, medical or, or training, tra tra medical training institutions, they are not conversant on how to certify cause of death. But there is a standard way in which the certification of cause of death is supposed to be done as guided by WHO. So that's what I'm referring to here as ICD-10 certification. So clinicians are supposed to uh, certify cause of death and uh, uh, the coding staff picking it up to, uh, to identify the specific uh, cause of death for tabulation. So that in itself is a, a barrier in terms of obtaining a quality data on the cause of death, even for those that occur in health facilities. The case is even worse for deaths that occur at home. One, that reporting is incomplete, we just saw they less than 50%, and two, that the reporting tools are not compliant with the WHO standards. And three, that since uh, we depend on assistant chiefs to uh, register the deaths that occur at home, the assistant chiefs are not uh, medically uh, oriented to do that. So uh, we depend on lay reporting on cause of death, which definitely doesn't um, help us to tease out the exact causes of, of death. Next. Then because of the interruption, I've given you an additional two minutes. Uh, please move towards wrapping up in two minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So lack of demand for vital registration uh, for various reasons is a huge backlog because of limited digitization, because for, for vital statistics to be generated, they need to be digitized. So because of uh, low registration coverage plus delays in production, then the, those, the few that even are produced, are, uh, the value is compromised. Next. Next. Opportunities. Um, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, my apologies, Sir Ben. Uh, Irene, please move up one more so that we're able to save time. This, you, have, you have skipped one. Yes. Thank you. Uh, opportunities. Uh, I've put this as, uh, as a verbatim quote. Uh, UN um, guides the in, uh, countries that civil registration is the best source of vital uh, registration compared to census and surveys. So this, as a starting point, is a huge opportunity for countries to take advantage of. Next. The CRVS related SD indicators provide a useful platform to stimulate investment in CRVS, goodwill for CRVS at global and regional levels. Uh, all UN agencies 
are in support of CRVS. We have AU, we have UNECA at regional level. Uh, existing collaboration with support from partners, we have UNICEF here, we have UNFPA, we have UNHCR. Then the uh, Constitution of Kenya uh, 2010, Chapter 3 on citizens is very clear that every citizen is allowed to registration documents. Next. Then we have the registration and education bill 2020, where registration is activated at birth and uh, the, the decapitated at death. There is an enabling environment, uh, enabling uh, pro, uh, policy and legislative uh, um, uh, framework in place. The current developed governance structure is another very useful opportunity that we should take advantage of. Demand for birth certificates for school admission and uh, uh, registration of uh, exam. Let's move, next. I have put a few recommendations here that this need to enhance public budgetary allocations to CRVS, we just saw the, the case of the allocation. We, we, the, that we need to explore pragmatic options to take advantage of existing or to increase vital registration. The immunization coverage is very high. Uh, why don't we take advantage so that when mothers go for immunize, they check whether we can um, uh, use that opportunity to register those that are not registered. Community health workers are uh, people or down on the ground who can take advantage of this. We need to create a demand for civil registration by identifying tangible benefits that can accrue from registration and anchor our civil registration to specific services. We will take advantage of the various debt collection efforts to identify a specific reason for non-registration. Um, it's not good enough just to say, well, these counties are not doing well. Why are they not doing well? Let's go there, find out, and see how best to go around those barriers that actually would have been identified by the communities themselves. The last slide there, Madam Chair. We need to build capacity of registration agents. I just cited the issue of capacities in both in health institutions and uh, registration agents at home. We need to develop the clear strategies of fitting uh, the registration system within the developed, developed governance structure such that they appreciate uh, the um, need to support and allocate uh, resources to collect, not, not to depend on the national government. Seven explore viable options of instituting autopsy. Viable autopsy is a way of trying to um, identify cause of death for deaths that occur outside health facilities. Eight, create demand for vital statistics and follow it up by instituting mechanisms to generate the vital statistics promptly. And lastly, that it takes time to. Uh, to improve vital registration because of the social cultural. Uh, elements involved. So uh, pleading for patience and time to partners involved. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ben Jarabi. Thank you so also for your grace as you navigated the, um, our inaugural presentation. Despite the challenges, you managed to deliver a powerful presentation. I will be getting back uh, when we get to the, dis uh, to, the, to the discussion on the challenges of um, ordinary citizens uh, being able to utilize or um, get access to civil registration, looking at how what role does poverty play, what role does uh, any fees that we have play, and just to make sure that uh, we look at inclusion, especially for vulnerable and uh, people who may not be able to access the, um, the, 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 the various offices. We'll also be tackling a little bit later on um, whether all of us are clear on just how vital these statistics are and what is it that we can do to raise a profile among policymakers for making sure that vital statistics is not only um, captured well, but also planned for so that, um, and I know UNFPA, UNICEF and others have, uh, uh, are very aware uh, of, of, of that conversation. And so as we move on, I want to now call the next panelist, um, Dennis Mwambi from PRB. And I would like you to also take a few minutes to be able to introduce yourself, Dennis, so that I, there is fairness 
among all my panelists. So I want you to go ahead as you do that introduction. Go ahead, Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is uh, Dennis Mwembi. I work with uh, PRB as a Senior Programs uh, Officer. And uh, today I'll uh, be taking uh, the team through just a few discussions around transforming research into policy. And we'll be able to even share experiences on uh, how it's able, how this is able to be done. So Chair, I'm uh, ready to delve into this if I have your permission. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. So uh, we are going to take time just looking at um, how research can be transformed into policy. And uh, part of the, let me see if I can move to the next slide. Irene, are you able to take me to the next slide? For uh, some reason, it's frozen. Are you able to see it? Not yet. Uh, I, I, I hope I will be able to present so that I can uh, move uh, quickly. I wonder whether that's something that I can be able to do. Okay, I'm giving you the rights. Eh? Just go ahead. I'm giving you the rights. Eh? Let me stop okay. sharing. Okay, please. Thank you. I'm giving, I'm giving all the panelists the rights. Eh? Yeah, yeah, that so please just yeah. share. Let me see if that can work. Perfect. That's good. Yep. And unfortunately, I can't be able to move from one slide to another. More time. Sorry for that. Oh, great. Uh, I hope uh, you're able to see. So what you're going to do in the few minutes that the chair has uh, granted us is that we're going to look at uh, where we do research very briefly. We are going to identify some of the policy gaps, uh, research policy gaps that exist, and then just spend a few minutes looking at how better can we be able to bridge the gaps uh, that exist. So part of the reasons that we do research uh, include, um, you know, ultimately we want to improve our social and health systems, advancing technology and medicine, improving health and other conditions, improving the quality of life. And so when this happens, it means that uh, research then needs to really address all these key things. But unfortunately, when you begin to look at what's happening currently in the environment, the good news is that evidence, evidence can be able to matter, but the bad news is that often it does not matter. So part of the reason that evidence does not matter is because when you look at the two groups of uh, of people, the researchers and the policy makers, there exists a gap. And uh, most of the times, uh, limited effort is put to be able to you know, address these gaps. And this keeps on persisting. And I realize that most of uh, the research that is done is not able to be converted into, uh, into policy. So one of the questions we ask ourselves is that, um, why does this uh, gap exist? And about four things come out. And some of these can be related even what's happening here in Kenya. Uh, the first one is uh, you're looking at the individual differences between the researchers and the policy makers. We are going to delve slightly into that. We're also going to look at the institutional roadblocks that exist between you know, policy and research, and then the issues around poor communication and the practical constraints that happen uh, when you look at the two groups of, uh, of people. So when you look at the individual differences, one of the key things that happen um, is that there's a mutual mistrust that happened between policymakers and, uh, and the researchers. When you look at these two groups, you realize that uh, they have uh, different points of views. Researchers think that sometimes policymakers are there and they're interested in just putting money into programs and uh, them money makes more sense. And when you look at the policymakers, they look at researchers as these people who, who manipulate, manipulate data to be able to force us to do things that are not supposed to be done. So there's that perpetual uh, mutual mistrust that happen between the two groups. And then there's also limited understanding between those uh, the two groups would tend not to understand the issues that affect or are faced by each of the uh, different groups. One of the things that happen is that researchers will be more interested in ensuring that they do you know, random sampling, come up with those uh, odds ratios. But that's just what's really matter for policymakers who are more interested to have practical solutions to problems that are affecting uh, the people. And that limited understanding ensures that uh, uh, data is not being used uh, to kind of you know, transform into, into policy. We also look at the differing experiences and capacities to understand and interpret data. And this is more to do with the, you know, the policymakers. All they want to hear is uh, what does it mean uh, to the people? And so when you begin to talk about 
uh, the different uh, interpretations of data, then these capacities, the limited capacities actually influence uh, how much of the research is being able to be used uh, to, to, to influence policy. And then there's also lack of clarity about the roles. Both groups don't see each other as partners. Each of them will be looking at themselves as complete and they don't think there's a need for them to be you know, partners with the different, uh, uh, the, the, the different groups. And this really ensures that there's persistent lack of uh, conversion of uh, research uh, into policy. Uh, one of the researchers in Pakistan mentioned that resistance is big basically because most of the policymakers don't think that research is essential for their policies. There's a general feeling among policymakers that there is, as far as policymaking goes, they are the experts. If you want to bring the researchers, then they will just come in and punch in the numbers. And when you have this kind of thoughts, it means that um, it will take so much time for research to be converted into, into policy, because then the, there's that lack of understanding in terms of the different roles uh, played by, by the two groups. When you look at the institutional roadblocks, one of the things that you look at is the different incentive systems and accountability metrics. Uh, where policymakers and researchers are held to different standards by the respective institutions. For researchers, they are supposed to do, you know, quality, thorough work when it comes to research. There's an amount of time and resources that are allocated to those processes. For policymakers, it's really about the things that are affecting the people. And so when you look at those different incentive systems, and then the gap keeps, uh, keeps uh, persisting as we move. There's also the unsupportive uh, cultures where research institutions will underestimate what, it, what has to be done uh, to work with the policymakers. Not about, uh, we talk about uh, the resources that are allocated to ensure that uh, research is converted into policy. I don't think research institutions really look at how this is supposed to be done. And so sometimes those unsupportive cultures uh, persist the issue around the gap between policy and, and research. Thinking about the high staff turnover, think about um, researchers and policymakers. Sometimes when you research institutions reach out to policymakers, they build their capacities. And at the time when they need to be able to use those capacities, sometimes you know, the movement of staff within departments or perhaps outside, when you talk about even the issues about the elections and all that, so you have a complete new set of uh, policymakers coming on board and you have to start from point zero. And so this high staff turnover also uh, kind of makes sure that the, uh, the gap continues to persist. There's this issue of our about lack of effective partnerships each of the groups will be working in silos because the incentive system is different and what they are working for uh, is different. And sometimes this really leads to a lack of uh, uh, conversion or transformation of research into policy. And then most importantly is the research donor agendas. Sometimes what research says is supposed to be done is not necessarily in line with what the policymakers will be able to be interested in or the local interests. And sometimes uh, this uh, uh, results into that. When we talk about communications, a very clear uh, challenge that persists across even beyond uh, research and policy, the issues around limited availability and access to research data. Think about where the research is communicated. It could be in journals, in reports that are kept somewhere. And the people that access most of this information would be fellow researchers and policymakers sometimes don't have access to this information, perhaps in a timely manner and completely sometimes uh, those information are not made available for the, uh, the policymakers to be able to access them. Think about information on our data overload. Research can generate so, so much information. So what is more critical for policymakers is supposed to be made available. So sometimes when you bring 100 things that uh, policymakers are supposed to be you know, looking at when, when you're talking about research, that overload results into policymakers losing interest in the research and going forward uh, and doing what they think is best to be done. Use of jargon, technical language is very critical. Sometimes you realize that research and jargon move hand in hand. So making sure that the information is broken down into pieces that policymakers can be able to understand becomes very critical. Lack of clear actionable messages for policymakers uh, also needs to be made available. Otherwise, without doing this, when you present all 100 things that policymakers are supposed to be doing or recommendations that are supposed to be followed, sometimes it ensure, it, it, it kind of persists the gaps that we've talked about. Um, uh, a a policymaker from Malawi said this, that reports are in an indigestible form without adequate analysis of policy or programmatic implications. Therefore, people note the findings, but they don't act on them because of what is it that I'm supposed to do if I'm a policymaker. So researchers need to make that information available. 
Uh, lastly, in terms of the things that are doing uh, persisting the, um, the gaps is the practical constraints, misaligned research processes. It takes so much time and the decision making process is an, you know, an evolving process. How do we ensure that the two are aligned so that policy uh, follows research? There's limited time for decision making sometimes and then competing priorities and agendas from the policy makers' point of view. So what is it that makes more sense for them at a particular time? Budget is also a problem, limitation in terms of inadequate budgets for dissemination of the research or budgets that are supposed to be made available for uh, the implementation of the recommendations. So that's supposed to be uh, looked into if all these gaps are supposed to be uh, bridged. So in summary, what is it that we need to do uh, when it comes to bridging the gap? between research and policy. Three key things are discussed here below. One of them is planning for research uptake, engaging policymakers and communic communicating strategically. And for uptake of research, some of the things that we need to look at is uh, designing studies to answer practical policy relevant questions, things around understanding what policymakers want and need to know so that you make that available in a timely manner for them to be able to address. I've talked about budget previously, ensuring that there's adequate time and money to be able to disseminate to be able to be able to uh, implement uh, the recommendations, making that information available for the policymakers and saying, if you need to implement this kind of uh, a recommendation, this is how much it's able, uh, it is able to be uh, required. Learning about policy process and factoring that into the research timeline, so it's also a critical thing to look at when you're planning for research uptake. When it's about issues around engaging the policymakers, one thing that you need to look at is collaboration with the policymakers as partners and cultivating enduring links between institutions and policymakers. How do we ensure that there is ongoing communication and conversation happening between research institutions and policymakers? You don't need to bring them at the end of the research, but ensuring that there's collaboration that is ongoing, uh, even as the research is going on, engaging policymakers early and throughout the research process is critical and building the capacity of the policymakers to understand and interpret research, breaking down for them to understand uh, so that they know what is that they need to do. Setting up mechanisms for regular updates and information exchange is another way that that can happen so that they start regular updates so that they understand why the research is important. And when you come to recommendation, then they can own the process as you do. And then lastly, when it comes to communication, uh, communicating strategically, uh, researchers need to uh, provide what we call clear and concise messages so that the policymakers are able to pick that up and move with them, providing information that can ensure policymakers are feel confident in taking into uh, each of those actions. And sometimes even looking at the actions and really relating that to the normal policymaking process and how it, communicating how important that is even for the policymakers themselves. Speaking directly to issues that policymakers care about is another way uh, we need to look at this so that we don't talk about the global picture, but really bring that down to where the our policymakers are proposing feasible and concrete actions along the uh, along the recommendations. It's also something that you can be able to do so that the research, I mean, the policymakers are able to take up uh, research. So I'll stop at that point, Chair, and uh, perhaps uh, and back uh, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dennis Mwambi, uh, for that good presentation. And it's interesting how the bridge that he has aligns exactly to what Ben Obonyo was, was uh, presenting, because the, when he talked about the, uh, the challenges and the complexities of acknowledging and using uh, civil registration data, that bridge is sometimes what is missing. And so taking the time to be able to create that bridge in what uh, Dennis has presented is actually a critical one. Before I ask um, uh, Irene whether uh, whether um, our chair has come on. Let me just mention that I think all of us have had that experience where very, very senior people who are inundated with all the things they must do to lead a country are presented as cartograph and uh, p-values and everything else. And you can already see the glazing over that takes place and then they are ready to move on to the next thing. So language that speaks to the policymakers is critical. Um, acknowledging uh, a clear goal for all of you so that you can follow all the specifications that Dennis has highlighted. So I just want to mention that both Dennis and Ben have aligned 100%. And now I want to uh, give the floor to my friend, Frederick Otieno. Frederick is um, Population and Data Policy Advisor for UNFPA based in South Africa. And um, I'm really, really glad that he's able to be here with us today 
And um, if uh, we, he can also introduce himself a little bit more because my um, information for him may be a bit outdated, but I just know him as a very passionate and very focused and very knowledgeable man. So Irene is our chair in as I hand over to Frederick to do the introduction. Kindly confirm whether our chair has joined. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Mm -hmm. Our chair is in. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we, we acknowledge the presence of our chair. Thank you. So my, my co-chair, Mr. Waweru, I would hand over to, um, uh, to Frederick as he presents. And then once he finishes presenting, then I would I, I release the chair, the co-chairing back to you. And then we have Mr. Paul Ngugi as the last presenter. Over to you, Frederick. Karibu sana. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. I really appreciate uh, the introduction, uh, but much more so the sharing of knowledge that uh, started yesterday. My name is Frederick Otieno Kwayo. I'm a Kenyan, actually, but I work for UNFPA in uh, Johannesburg in the regional office. Uh, just like the chair said, I'm a regional advisor for population and development, basically on uh, the data side. But apart from that, uh, I would say that uh, before working in Johannesburg, I also worked in a couple of countries in Asia. That is in Myanmar and Timor-Leste, but also in Liberia. And before then, I used to work for the statistics office in Kenya. And I know a lot of colleagues are uh, in uh, in-house. So basically, this is uh, more of uh, a sharing of knowledge of knowledge and experiences. But one thing that I have to say from onset is that as UNFPA, we do not produce data, but what we do is to support member states, including Kenya on strengthening their capacities, but also on uh, ensuring that they uh, measure to the, to the international standards with a view to improving the production analysis and also utilization of, uh, of data. Uh, and uh, uh, basically using data to, 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 to monitor progress of SDGs, or, but also of the national development uh, planning processes. So I'm quite uh, delighted and I think my presentations really feeds into the previous ones that have been done by Jarabi and also by Dennis. So looks like my slides are not moving. I don't know why. So let me just stop um, and start again. Yeah, why don't you reshare again? Okay. Is not. I've given you all the rights to share. Okay. Okay, that's good. All right. It's not moving, Irene. So, Irene, can you um, try and see whether you can okay. share? I oh, think uh, I think I can. Uh, I know what to do there. So basically, just my presentation would be first of all about uh, just a bit of background on 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 context, but then after that, I'll talk about what we consider as UNEP as a population and development data framework. Because ideally, now that um, uh, Kenya would want to develop a population policy. In terms of uh, really uh, the types of data which is required, what are the, some of the framework that indeed guides all the countries within Africa? Then after that, I'll talk about uh, a few opportunities, uh, challenges, but also partnerships which do exist in, in, in terms of data. And then we'll talk about uh, recommendations and then also some aspects of what are some of the roles that UNFPA could play. So as I was really preparing for this presentation, what actually came to mind is that Kenya has a very modern uh, statistic act, and uh, also they have a good structure on production, dissemination, and also utilization of official statistics. And uh, this is enshrined in, uh, in uh, the statistics act, which was uh, actually initially pu published in 2006, but then revised in uh, 2019. Also, what is coming out is that Kenya has a wealth of data, but also data set from censuses, surveys, and administrative systems or records. Although the coverage rates, have, as, as has been highlighted by Ben, are quite low, 
uh, and therefore, and also accessing them is, is, a, is a bit of a challenge. Also something to consider is that as much as we may not know as Kenyans, but actually within Kenya, we have some of the best research in, institutes or institutions on population and development, which are recognized regionally, but also globally. We talk of AFIDEP and um, you remember the excellent presentation which was done by all the key remarks done by AFIDEP uh, COE and then uh, the others. But I think what really remains a challenge is the accessibility of all these potential, all, all these data to potential users. And uh, besides also the targeted analysis, but also packaging, uh, packaging all what is there uh, 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 to feed into what the country requires. The next uh, slide, I'll not talk much about it, but the only thing I would want to highlight is that uh, I hope all of us, we are aware of the Addis Ababa Declaration on Population and Development, uh, which is actually the framework to guide data generation and utilization insofar as uh, 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 the population and development is concerned. And this is linked to the ICPD because in each of the continents of the world, uh, the continents have actually agreed on the mechanisms for monitoring the ICPD. And therefore, in the African contract, uh, continent, we have what is called the Addis Ababa Declaration on Population and Development. And this is what is going to even guide the generation of data which is required. Now, having said that, basically, as UNFPA, what we are saying is that for us to talk about data, it would be important to look at what are some of the contexts that we are talking about. And uh, it, uh, uh, before even co coming to the major sources of data and what we really need to, uh, uh, to, to focus on and evaluate where we are as a country, it is good to look at some of the changing context. And um, uh, the, the first of it is the migration. And indeed, although in Kenya, we do not have a lot of international migration, but actually what we have is the, uh, is the, is the internal migration, which whenever we are generating data, we have to really uh, leave cognizance of. The other one is the urbanization and whether it is a positive or negative. And then the, the third changing context or context is actually the increasing inequalities within the country. Because ideally, even within the urban areas, we have a lot of inequalities, which really, as we are producing data, that need to be at the back of our minds. The climate change and also the humanitarian issues uh, as, as, as COVID, whereby this really requires uh, 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 very dynamic data and also robust. So within the population and development, we look at the different aspects of uh, data. I think the first is the censuses and the surveys. And here, Kenya really scores well because Kenya is one of the countries that have these the censuses, but also a lot of surveys and therefore the data do exist. But when we come to the second data sources, which is administrative systems, uh, here we have the health management information system, we have the gender, we have the police, we have the CRVS. The, uh, uh, first of all, the coverage is not quite optimal, apart from the Ministry of Health, but then also really uh, 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 the analysis of this is not that uh, well. And the third one is on the humanitarian data, which indeed, as we are talking about uh, development, population and development, we need to have a, a real dynamic uh, uh, humanitarian data sets that should be that 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 should be available. And then thirdly, or, or the fourthly, and lastly, is on research and uh, the innovation aspect. And here is whereby we are talking about combining all these data sources, but also uh, 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 making use of uh, uh, the available data to really transform it into into information. And uh, this, to a large extent, I think Kenya is doing well, but I think we can do much better. But as we do all this analysis, as we do all these data sources, we need to really keep focus on what do we want to do with it. And I think the first one is the, is the country's uh, vision 2030. We have the SDGs, but also we have ICPD. And you remember when the, the minister was opening the conference yesterday, he talked about the 17 commitments which the government, the president made on, on, on the people of Kenya during the, the, the Nairobi summit. So all these data sets that we are talking about, the indicators, the research, really need to focus on this, and this should be our goal. Now, having said that, 
I was talking about the Addis Ababa Declaration on, uh, on, uh, on Population and Development. And basically here is, this is a continental more or less uh, specific guidance and uh, guideline for the implementation of the ICPD. And it was approved by the heads of state uh, 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 through the African Union. And then it, it is having about 88 commitments which are equivalent to indicators. And these are divided into uh, six pillars. So when we are generating data, we need to really focus on these 88 commitments which are indicators. And therefore we have to make sure that the data set that exists and even research uh, responds to all this. The first one is on dignity and equality, which talks about issues to do with like gender-based violence, issues to do with poverty, all of them. And under that, we have about 29 indicators or commitments that each country is supposed to report on. Then the other one, the second one is on health, which actually talks about both the maternal health, the, 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 the child health, and all issues about mobility. And that accounts for almost 16 indicators. So all this, we need to be cognizant of this so that at least we should be able to, to report. And I'm glad to say that the last uh, 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 ICPD review, which was done in 2018, I was reading actually the Kenyan report la uh, last evening because we managed to get all the 23 reports from, from, from the region. And the Kenyan report actually highlights some of the weaknesses, especially on data and statistics which as we develop the population policy, then we need to identify and really work on. And then lastly, also this framework indeed is designed to support the efforts to harness the demographic dividends, also advance the human rights, but also meet the SDGs and, uh, and, uh, and the vision 2030. So also the Addis Ababa Declaration has been mapped so that it, it, it actually feeds onto the other global frameworks. So that you can maybe just see that it is not really working in vacuum, but then it is supporting and reinforcing all the other development frameworks. Now, having said that, as I was going through this, I also said that we needed to really come up with what are some of the challenges, the opportunities, but also uh, uh, the partnerships that exist. And indeed, in the case of Kenya, and uh, like the, 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 the rest of Africa, I think the first really biggest challenge is the governance structure and coordination. Because not all data is actually being, uh, uh, is being generated by the KNBS, but actually we have a lot of coordination issues, but also uh, uh, a lot of um, how to put all these data sets together. So the governance issues and the coordination still remains the biggest challenge when it comes to the data systems in the country and therefore we need to look at it. Just also the other thing that also is coming out just like was mentioned by Ben is, an, is inadequate funding and also dependence on the, the, the external resources. Because ideally a lot of surveys in, uh, in Kenya, whether it's DHS, mix household budget surveys, all of these things are being uh, are dependent on the donors. So ideally, we need to look at a way of the government really sustaining it. And Kenya also moving to the upper middle income country soon. Uh, 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 I, I, ideally, we need to start thinking of really self-reliance uh, uh, because countries within the region like Botswana, South Africa, Seychelles and Mauritius, they are adequately supporting their population and, uh, and uh, data issues so that at least this, this, this should be a, a major recommendation. But also the other thing is the inadequate collaboration of data, pro uh, data producers and users. Because ideally, when it comes to population and development, the, the, uh, uh, the institution that are producing data in most cases do not really consult widely like is the case now. But actually, if, for example, we are going to do a survey and we have a proper collaboration, therefore, the only data that will be generated will be those that are required by either policymakers, the parliamentarians, uh, 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 but also the program people, so that we don't just collect information for the sake of it. And then the other thing is also the underutilization of the uh, underutilized role of research and development. Because ideally, 
like uh, we have the PSRI, we have uh, the Pop Council, all these organizations, the KIPRA, but I'm not quite sure that we've really optimized their utilization. So those becomes really the challenges. We have a lot of opportunities, the existing frameworks, which we are talking of the vision 2030. We talk of the uh, population, uh, 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 population uh, policy that we are developing right now. And all these have really increased the, the demand for uh, uh, good data sets. And also the robust uh, administrative data system. So these are some of the opportunities that exist that we need to harness on. In terms of partnerships and collaborations, I've talked about all these research organizations, but also we have the UN system, we, ha we have the, uh, the PRB, who are really good in terms of packaging uh, the data to target uh, uh, the policymakers, but also action. So all this we need to really take care of. Now, the other thing that I also wanted to talk about, just as we are talking of the SDGs, I think the main important thing is the concept of the leave no one behind. And ideally, this calls for the disaggregated data. In Kenya, as I was going through uh, uh, my presentation yesterday, a lot of information that exists now is only at the national level and then at the regional or the former provincial level. But ideally, we do not have adequate information when it comes to the county, the sub-county, but also at a much lower level so that we should be able to identify really those people who are most left behind. So as we talk of the data, I think the main thing would be that how do we really come up with the disaggregated data? The UN recommends a set of, uh, a set of the parameters or characteristics that could be considered. And this is just for uh, things like age, income, location, subnational, but also disability and other aspects. So this would be, I think, quite uh, relevant to the Kenyan scenario. We have done similar work in, uh, in other countries. This is, for example, when Malawi did their census and also did the SARA survey uh, through WHO. So we managed to really do the sub-national uh, analysis up to the level of uh, sub-location in Kenya, whereby it is possible to identify which sub-locations are really left behind in terms of some of the uh, aspects. So it would be good as we go forward and also developing this population policy that if, for example, we can come up with mechanisms of even using big data in terms of the high resolution satellite imagery and combining it with some of the existing data, then we do similar analysis uh, uh, with, the, um, with the relevant organization. This would really help in, uh, in, uh, in identifying the areas where all these support are required. Uh, this is, for example, an example whereby we were looking at the health facilities in Malawi, the whole of Malawi, and also using the SARA data and the catchment area information using the census, all those facilities with the three uh, uh, modern contraceptive methods and uh, five modern contraceptive methods, we were actually to map it so that, for example, if the Ministry of Health would want to, uh, uh, to target some of the areas, then indeed this is quite necessary. So this is the, time, the type of analysis that maybe uh, 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 the Kenya uh, team could really think of, and as UNFPA, we could be re ready to provide the support required. <coughs> so, I, want to, I want to check in on your time so that I can get for you additional time. You have how many more slides, two or three? Uh, just uh, two slides. Okay, go ahead. So that because we want to make sure we don't cut you off. So please go ahead. Okay, so in terms of recommendations, what we are seeing, or what you're saying as UNFPA, uh, in terms of improving population and development data, I think the first thing that we, we are saying is that we need to use the Addis Ababa Declaration on Population and Development Framework as a monitoring mechanism for the population policy and to create data requirement based on the pillars. This indeed will help in identifying some of the data gaps and then look at ways of, of, uh, of, uh, of filling those gaps. The second thing we are thinking of or we are recommending is that we need to really come up with a strategy to improve the coverage and ways of harnessing data from administrative system. You know, as we go forward, and I, I, this also has come severally, relying on, uh, on, uh, on surveys where the data is only available after, after five years, it would be good to really invest more in some of these administrative uh, uh, systems. 
And I think, uh, thirdly, the KNBAs and other data uh, uh, producers need to work with the national, uh, 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 the national research in institute to undertake further analysis on data collected to inform uh, policies and programming. And I think this has also been highlighted in uh, the presentation done by, uh, uh, made by, by, by Dennis. And I think basically the other thing would be to just some thinking of how do we strengthen the capacity and provide resources for generation of data and evidence at the county level. Because ideally we are talking more at the national level but I think a lot of data is required at the county level now that we have the de devolved system. But also to, for us to do all these things, we need to embrace and use new uh, innovative ways uh, as presented by technology in disseminating data by all the institutions. So we know Ministry of Health, CRVS, uh, 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 Bureau, PSRI, all of them are having this information. So it's just a question of how do we work together in doing that? And then the last is to really embrace partnership in terms of, because population and development is actually affected by other factors. So as we go, move forward, we really need to uh, uh, see how to partner with, uh, with those so that at least we, ca we, we should be in a position to, uh, to work together. And in all these things, what are some of the UNFPS contribution? I think uh, UNFPS uh, will continue to coordinate the, the, the census and to make sure that all the indicators are generated. We are also uh, will promote access and utilization of data. For example, through the mapping and uh, the survey data using some of the online uh, uh, GIS platforms. This indeed we, will, we should be able to do. Also promoting the generation of data and evidence at sub-national level by the use of the small area estimation whereby like I showed you in Malawi. And then others would be to uh, for example, in terms of uh, the review of progress of the uh, December public declaration and some of the modalities to really make sure that it uh, is generated. We are already uh, supporting the CRVS, but also we need to move to the others like uh, the CRVS, but also work with other partners in improving the, 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 the coverage. Uh, Chair, that is my last present presentation. Um, uh, thank you. And um, we can discuss further in the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. As always, you don't disappoint. We appreciate the wealth of knowledge you bring back to Kenya. And also for the fact that even despite all the countries you travel, you continue to hold Kenya at the bottom of your heart. So we are very thankful for that. Over to you, my co-chair, Mr. Kamawaweru, to take it from here. Thank you so much. Uh, I am proposing, Madam Shiparo, mm -hmm. now that you have the timelines and everything, <laughs> that you continue. Please consider me as your wingman. We planned about this. It has worked out well. I'm here mm -hmm. behind you for sharing as we go. Please proceed. Thank you so much. And Thank so you. now uh, I will definitely proceed. Um, I will now request, I don't know why my network is, uh, okay, we are back. I will now request uh, Mr. Ngugi, are you in the house? Yes, I can see you there. So are you controlling your slides? And yes, wonderful. So Mr. Ngugi, as with everybody else, could I ask you to do a short introduction and um, I'll let you now proceed with your 10 minutes and then we can, so that we have time for discussion. Over to you, Mr. Ngugi. Okay, thanks, Chair. Uh, a quick introduction. My name is Paul Waweru. I work for Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. I'm a manager there in charge of population statistics, I joined KNBS in 2005. So, so I think straight to my topic, uh, and uh, it's quite mouthful, it's about population data generation, availability and utilization for decision making in the era of technological advancement in Kenya. This is in light of achievement of Kenya Vision 2030, 2030 SDG, and Agenda 2063. So straight to introduction, I just want to give a brief introduction on, since I'm, I'll, I'll be talking about population data, uh, I'll need to give a brief on wh where we are. Uh, the last census was done in 2019, in August 2019. This was uh, the sixth since independence, and we've done 
each uh, a census every 10 year since 1969. So for 2019 census, Kenya adopted the use of mobile technology to collect data during the 2019 census as recommended by the UN for the 2020 round of censuses. Uh, I also want to report that these were the first sensors in Kenya to use mobile technology in the capture and transmission of data for both cartographic mapping and sensors enumeration. So uh, I also need to report that the, the purpose of doing that sensors was for us to respond to the needs, to the data needs for Kenya Kenya's development agenda, that is Vision 2030 and the Big Four agenda. We're also doing this so that we could provide data for SDGs and Agenda 2063. We, we're also doing the census in order to address increasing demand for official statistics and provide benchmark evidence for other statistical development and infrastructure. So uh, the objective of the census was to get data for demographic, social, and economic characteristics. We also needed to do to take stock of housing and also collect data for housing condition and housing amenities. So straight to population policy, why do we need data that will guide population policy? We need the reliable data to cover these areas, population structure and vulnerable groups, that's age, sex. We also, for the vulnerable, we have the young, we have the youth, we have the active and the aged. So we also need data for population and socioeconomic development, planning and environmental sustainability. We also require data for reproductive health and reproductive rights, education, science and technology, gender equity, equality and women empowerment. Though we also collect data for morbidity and mortality. Which data is available? What data do we have in Kenya? So based on the 2019 census, uh, Kenya population was enumerated at 47.6. Okay, the message has disappeared at 47.6 billion from 37.7 million in 2009. And for in the census, we collected for, for us to be able to respond to the issue of population size, we were able to collect uh, data using the variables such as relationship to the head, age of the respondent or of the members, their sex, their place of birth, their, and their marital status. The availability of this data, such kind of data helps us to track the annual population growth rate, number of children below 18 years, the young people, the active age population, the elderly, persons with disability, and also we're able to get spatial distribution of the population that is rural versus urban. Waweru, I want, I want, I want, the data I want on fertility request. and mortality. Waweru, yes. I want to request because um, Yes, the, yes, the, the overall timing for the conference is changing in terms of how long we can have in the breakup. I would like you to be able to not read your slides, but to just summarize as you go through, because we have about seven minutes left. Okay. And so I just got a okay. message from the overall coordinator. So kindly just, just talk through your slides as opposed okay, to reading okay. them. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So co concerning fertility and mortality, we were able to collect data on children ever born. This was as women age 12 years and above and they were able to provide that information. Then they were also supposed to provide information con concerning their last live birth and wh where it occurred and the sex of the child and whether that child is alive. So we were also able to collect information for on fertility and mortality at household level. And here we, we were asking the number of, number of people who were born within the last 12 months and if they are alive or dead and where if the person is dead or not, and if they died, what were the causes? So from there, we were able to get indicators for the total fertility, the infant mortality, mm -hmm. and also for maternal mortality ratio. So then the issue of migration, 
we we are able to we were able to ask the questions of the previous residents and the reasons for migration and we also had a questionnaire that we were asking for the uh, migrants so those who had moved out of the country in the last six months for at least 50 the last 15 years for at least six months and the, we were able to get their details so we also needed to ask the information about education and there we were asking those who are five years and above we needed to know their schooling status the highest level they had reached and, com and com completed so that we were able to see school enrollment and school attainment status so for those indicators then concerning labor force we we asked some questions you know that this data is very key so we were able to ask for those who are five years and above the economic status who who are the employer and the occupation they are in so concerning poverty levels we used our wealth index which is an index based on the data collected at household level now and we get that from information such as the assets such as tv mobile phone uh, characteristics of the dwelling unit and maybe water water source among others then uh, concerning ict we also asked some questions maybe the mobile phone ownership and usage usage of internet and computers and also we had a new question on com commerce e-commerce usage some other information that we had or collected was based we used the short questionnaires to collect information for travelers out to your sleepers mm -hmm. we'll get back to you. so we'll we'll just wait and until we find it yes because those, those are not available in market anywhere oh, okay. i apologize yes. for that in interruption and um, so how long do we keep you you keep uh, i can thank you so much i what one of the things i would like Ngug, is that uh, if you could move to your last slide uh, because we have three minutes and 57 seconds and I want to be able to acknowledge the, the presenters. Could you please move to your last slide in terms of any recommendation you have? Oh. Yes, please move to the last slide. Okay. Uh, actually, yeah, actually the last one was about the data dissemination, how we disseminate that data. Okay, mm -hmm. These are the reasons why we disseminate, but then I needed to show people how the forms of data that we have for dissemination, we have micro data and its outputs, that is the tabulations. We also uh, disseminate uh, I, uh, GIS products, that's from cartographic mapping, and how do we distribute them from publications, seminars, or electronic media. And we, we have our websites here where people can get the, the data. For census, we only give 10% of the data because it's quite huge, but 10% 10 is uh, representative and they can get all the indicators they need those that's my last slide you are you are amazing under pressure thank you Aweru. and i want to mention that all these presentations yeah, under be, pressure actually yes we apologize a hundred percent all these uh, presentations will be available from uh, the conference website and i also want to mention that uh, our role as PRB, UNFPA, and everybody who's represented here is really looking at how data can be used to improve policy making. And so this is a, not the last discussion we are going to have. And so I just want to acknowledge my co-chair, Mr. Waweru. I want to acknowledge NCPD. And I want to acknowledge each of, each of the presenters, Mr. Ngugi. Thank you for even just presenting and letting us know about the census, for Ben Jarabi for making civil registration an interesting topic to look at and highlighting the issues we need to look at, for PRB, how to bridge that gap from research to policy, and for Frederick, just being able to let us know what are some of the data, um, what are some of the recommendations you have made around population and development and your commitment as UNFPA to transforming that conversation. I know we had promised that you would have an opportunity to uh, give your input. I apologize on behalf of the conference uh, organizers, but this is not our last engagement. I can assure you that out of all these um, uh, breakout rooms, there will be recommendations that will go into the conference report where we will make sure that if there is further deliberation that is required, then we can then be able to organize because that is our mandate. And so, 
we are left with one minute and 18, uh, 16 seconds. And I just want to thank you all of you for making time to come to this breakout room because without you, the presenters would not have been effective. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And have a good day, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you for the great Thank moderation. You, All right. Um, if you, please, if, um, if, 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 if you hold on, you will be returned back to the main session in 44 seconds. Go ahead, Irene, or Lois. Please, de please de delegates, don't log out. Kindly go to the button uh, beneath. There is uh, a provision there, the key for the breakout rooms. Kindly go there and select your thematic area. Thank you. Don't log out eh, completely. Go to the breakout rooms. Eh? If you're having challenge, let us know. You can you can uh, use the chat bar. Thank you. Just thank you, Irene. Thank you, Lois. Uh, it's the breakout for the next session. She means. Okay.